I'm Martin and welcome to another great edition of MP Astro. Now in this video I'm really excited about this one. This is going to be a very challenging uh, project to do. With this Master 180 I've got here. This is a fantastic telescope if you're imaging planets or the moon. Its main purpose is planetary and lunar work. It's great at showing all the fantastic details on surfaces of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, even the cratings and the moon valleys and all that on, on the moon's surface. It really is a fantastic telescope and the advantage of this telescope is that the Magstoff has uh, a longer focal length and that focal length can really boost the magnification and the power on homing in on those details and that's what this telescope is really designed for so what that means is with the boosting that contrast as well uh, the other advantage of this particular model the 180 is got a very small central obstruction as well so that will enhance the contrast it will also um, makes just the images it's a little bit sharper not as sharp compared to a refractor don't get me wrong refractors have no central obstruction and you've got a clear light cone coming in and focus and refracted to a point and that's why refractors will always be awesome for high res images so I've done a few modifications if you've not seen these videos on the Mac 180 I've done these super tune this Mac 180 I've done a lot of work to it already as you can see it has really improved the performance of this um, telescope right these modifications so if you've not seen that super tune the Mac 180 please check it out at the top I highlight how you can do certain things to this telescope to make it better I do highlight in a lot of detail they're all long videos I'm afraid but the thing is they're constructive videos and the projects that they work and that's the main key aspect of this channel all right it's for you guys and girls to undertake these projects knowing with confidence that they're going to work now with this video I'll be honest with you, this project what I'm trying to do with this Mac 180 the Macs are very hard to image and the reason why I'm saying they're very hard to image is because of the longer focal length of that telescope uh, you're going to get a narrow field of view and trying to image uh, deep space is a real challenge on this particular telescope however what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to disclose this factor as we're going to try this project and see what we can do with this 180 and again there's not many videos that's based around the 180 but believe me with this project what I'm trying to undertake this is going to be a real challenge and I'm just fingers crossed that things work out for me. I've done a lot of planning into this uh, project and uh, it's taken me months to try and figure this out all right and it, it sounds stupid but I really put a lot of hard work into these videos so please hit a like button and again please subscribe onto my channel if you're new to the channel also hit the bell by hitting that bell will keep you notified on the new videos that I'll be publishing very very soon and believe me like always I've got loads of videos that I will publish out so I do spend a lot of hard time trying to figure out ways to improve on your existing equipment and these videos what I do they're not just they're not just here to show off these are very practical videos which you can undertake they work because I never launch a video giving you guys and girls the wrong information and that's what you don't want so if you're interested in what I'm going to do on this project I'm going to undertake and see if I can turn this Mastoff into an astrograph fingers crossed if you go on this telescope yourself and you want to find out more please keep watching and let's do this so the first steps of modifying as you've noticed I have the lost Mandy dovetail from Alto Astro 
Really good dovetail, very good quality. The only drama I have with it is it's a tad expensive what it is. However, there are a lot of Lost Mandy's that are a lot more expensive than this one. And believe me, they're coming like 70, 80 quid for a dovetail. This, however, is around about 38 quid to 39 quid. So still, it, it is pricey, but it's a very good aluminium billet bar Lost Mandy dovetail. It's really good. Now the thing I need to highlight is, as you notice, at the top I've installed a seven, seven to eight inch dew strap. Now this fits perfectly on the Mac 180. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Lynx Astro dew band. Now I could use a dew shield, but however, because of the setup, I want to reduce the weight. So I just want a dew band. The dew band fits perfectly. Again, they're about 40 to about 50 pounds for this uh, dew band. But the, the actual cabling is really good. Very long cabling. And it's a very good silicon, fle very flexible wires. Really good quality wires. Now this Lynx Astro dew shield, uh, this dew uh, heater band can power off any power source. Uh, it which draws around about two amps if at the most. It's not a lot of power, and this can be powered through me Pegasus Astro or my juice or my juice zapper power unit. All right, it's uh, got this from First Light Optics as well. So again, all the links are at this description below. Okay, so if you want to figure out, uh, if you want, to, if you're interested in this product, please check it out at the bottom. The other addition is this. Now I featured this in my Skywatcher Skyhawk um, Astrograph. If you've not seen the video Unleash the Power 1 and Unleash the Power 2, please check out those videos at the top. In there I've converted a 114mm aperture Newtonian, which was designed for visual but is now converted to an astrograph and I can take awesome deep sky images with it and again please check those videos at the top if you're interested now this is a, a vixen dovetail bracket very high quality made cost between about 20 to about 30 pounds this is bolted onto the lost mandy okay and it's got a really good clamping system okay now this clamping system is really crucial because with this maxitov the main problem with Maxitovs is because of the longest focal length, if you get any minute of flexure, and I mean even slight, it will affect the tracking on your mount. Even when you're auto guiding, you're going to get star trailing. And any minute flexure, or free play I call it, so for example, I mean this is a good clamping force, but if for example, I'm going to fit my guide scope on there. I want it to be really secure. Even on set here, I've mounted three bolts across on this on the scope rings, and it's I've got three bolts at the top of here as well. That's to reduce flexure on the dovetail on the Lost Mandy bar. And here, if you take a closer look, I've installed metric six screws. They're not ideal size, but I've also screwed a one quarter bolt from the other end. So I've got three bolts supporting that bracket, which seems a bit excessive, but if you check, it seems a bit obsessive, but if you check it out, you can see the bolt here, that's bolted on the other side. Okay, so here it's bolted in, very secure, very rigid, and that's what you want. And as you can see, I can't move anything, there's no free play. And this is very crucial, all right? Flexure will cause havoc on your guiding. You're not gonna get the best track in the world. If your guide scope flexures, it's an absolute nightmare. The next step was to fit a guide scope. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me, why don't you use a off-axis guider? I have thought about it and I have considered that, well, it can't be an off-axis guider 
because if you're imaging through the same optical train you're not going to get as much flexure and the and they are right it, it, you do get the best tracking with an off axis guider but I will highlight later in the video why I can't adapt an off axis guider and believe me you'll be shocked to find that it's not possible to fit an off axis guider on this particular model so I have thought about considering getting something like this now this is a fantastic little scope for a beginner right this is a 17 millimeter refractor all right fantastic little spotting scope the optics are really good for a little acro and you do get some decent eyepieces with it and a, and a, a reasonable prism now the biggest flaw with this particular brand uh, with this particular model that the tripod even despite it comes with its own travel case and all that the only thing that lets it down is the tripod it's absolutely rubbish it's so wobbly and all that and seriously as a beginner I would get frustrated I would need a better tripod to, to get the capabilities of this fantastic little refractor it really is good for its price I would get rid of the finder scope and have a red dot finder because that would be better and the dew shield is a bit on the small side all right this will dew up in no time so the dew shield needs to be a little bit bigger but apart from that the telescope itself is really is a joy to use however I was consider mounting this on the Mac this would be a great little accessory as a guider all right it's lightweight it less probably weighs about a kilo and a bit not a lot of weight so when you put your guide scope and on that it really is a fantastic little guide scope now the main problem with a bigger telescope with its longer focal length you cannot use small finders all right or small guide scopes if you're using something that it's not because of the aperture you can use a 60 millimeter or a 50 millimeter guide scope but you've got to use longer focal length guide scopes to compensate with the guiding now I'm not going to go into too much depth of calculations and why there is but I have used and I have calculated on the website if you check out the link below there is a website that you can you can calculate the ideal guide scope for a given focal length of a telescope I have used that to some degree and to be honest here it's accurate but it's never a perfect match but what I found out to round it off is you cannot use a guide scope less than I mean 200 millimeters is not ideal you need something a little bit longer focal length and the reasons why you need that longer focal length is because the tracking errors on a longer fo focal length the guy there will struggle to try and find the motion of the stars wide field telescopes are easier to use because they don't need high demands of performance of the mount okay it, I don't know how that works all right I'm not gonna to go too much in depth on that but what I know is is if you're gonna use this existing setup with its f15 f15 is like 2700 millimeters that's a long focal length all right for this telescope f15 is very hard to image with to get deep sky objects so this is a real challenge and this is what I mean it's a real challenge so what I found out that 400 may be down as low as probably 240 millimeters might be just enough guide uh, guide scope to be able to image with your setup. It is a real challenge because you need a big guide scope. You need that longer focal length to compensate. So the close up on this 70 millimeter it really is a good little telescope but the biggest flaw is this 
you see the free play? Look at that. If I extend it out a bit more, it gets worse. This is flexure in the focus tube. Now even the tube is nice and straight, it might be plastic but it's quite rigid. But the biggest flaw on this particular model is the flexure. All right. As soon as you put a guide camera on there, you're going to get problems with this flexure. And you can see it there. I'll just try and hold it best I can so you can see it. See that? It's not ideal. And this is the disadvantage of this would have been perfect as a guider. But that flaw is, is, that free, is that free play in that focuser. Now, every focusers have free play to some certain degree. But if you're guiding with a high, with a, with a longer focal length, that, mu, that, muna, that minute play will show the tracking errors on your mount. And it's not, it's not fit for purpose. So I need to seek another alternative. But there are ways to improve on it. You can tighten the screws at the back to make it a bit more rigid. And there is a lockdown screw as well, which also helps. Also, if you want to use a, uh, like a zoo camera or a Alto Astro, a, or a, a GP1 camera, you still you just need that prism or an extension tube to focus the image. Because, like always, you've got to extend the focus uh, out a bit more on those cameras. So you need uh, at least a two-inch, a two-inch extension on there to give that that ability for that camera to achieve focus, which again adds more weight. Plus, like always, adding more flexure onto the focuser. It's only a lightweight plastic focuser. It's not only designed for putting eyepieces and a diagonal or a prism. All right, it's only suitable for visual stuff. It's a fantastic little scope, beginner scope. So, unfortunately, this is just good. This is just basically going to be used for something like just general viewing. All right, but fantastic little scope. It's a real shame. I wish it could be made as a decent guider but I will look into like try to improve on this telescope because again it has a lot of potential and again a lot of beginners will be able to uh, use this telescope reasonable and get reasonable uh, images through it you know it's really good really good little refractor but as a guider I'm afraid nah not good so the next step was to invest in this. This is a 60 millimeter guide scope. I don't know what brand it is, right? But I will provide the links at the bottom. I paid literally 74 pounds, which to be honest with you, it sounds expensive, but what you notice is you are paying for quality. Now this is aluminium tubing all the way across. The scope rings are aluminium, they've got felt tip uh, ends on there so it doesn't mar the tube. Uh, the actual optics is a 60mm optics and as you can see they really are good coatings for a guide scope. Okay, It can be used as a guider but as you can see there, very good uh, dew shield as well. So it's got this dew shield. And it's quite deep, so it doesn't. It will keep uh, or a lot of dew out. You'll find that there is a. Um, I've fitted a Lynx Astro. This is just a two-inch band. All right, it's a bit on the. It's a bit on the small side for the 60 millimeter aperture, but it fits perfectly around there. So, again, the Lynx Astro, really good. Dew. Uh, dew heater on there, right? Very crucial because when you when you're guiding, you don't want the objective lens to uh, mist up, and it will affect your guiding, and then that's you. Uh, uh, it's, it's ruined the whole night's imaging because the tracking will go will go to pot. All right, so you have to fit something like a, a dew heater if you've got very dewy night, 
this will prevent the dew from settling on the objective lens. But it really is, really is a fantastic guide scope because it's got baffles as well. So it's all metal construction. Uh, the caps are good. One thing I did replace with it is I've replaced it with, I put a, a 5 inch Vixen dovetail. And it, but I've just used the existing bolts. They bolt straight onto the scope rings. And it's quite sturdy and it won't uh, flex. I wasn't going to prepare to use the standard. This is the standard dovetail. Now this dovetail fits on finder, finder scopes. Uh, the other little brackets you usually see. It's a smaller Vixen in a way. But the problem is with that it's... Because you're using a 60mm guide scope, it's not the best dovetail, I'm afraid. I mean, look at it, it's quite flimsy. It is aluminium construction, but uh, it wasn't sturdy enough, and that's why I invested the Vixen, which is a, a little bit more weight, but it's a lot chunky, a lot more rigid, and that's what you want. You cannot afford to have any free play or flexure in your images. The actual scope, the main tube, weighs around about 200, maybe 300 grams. That's not including the, the rings, the, uh, the Vixen dovetail, the guide scope and the dew heater bands. This will probably weigh probably about a kilogram, maybe a little bit more, but it's still pretty lightweight. Now one unique feature I would like about this guide scope is if we take a closer look. On this guy scope, there is a lock screw where you can extend. And the good thing is, there's not much free play there. Okay, if I wiggle that around, there's not much free play at all. It's really good draw tube, extension tube. I like how they put, I like how they put uh, the uh, position there for the focus thing as well so you know when you get your focus you know exactly uh, w where you want it it's quite sturdy and when you lock it down there's no free play at all there's also a twist focus again very sturdy in fact quite a bit stiff but that's what you want you don't want any free play and it focus with a twist lock like that and it gives you a good probably 10 to about 20 millimeter of travel okay so you've got a, a micro focus there you also got a t2 thread so if you've got a zoo isi 120 which is the older type which doesn't slot in you can thread that on there as well and one thing i've noticed is i have i have i have adjusted this guide scope this is fully extended out and uh, to allow uh, focus on this guide scope okay so the, this is the only drawback now the main thing I've got this guide scope is that the focal length on this is around 240 millimeters it is a risk it's where I'm going to take it might not do the job I'm not quite sure but I'm prepared to take the risk for you guys and girls all right uh, but this is the only 60mm guide scope that I can find that's got a longer focal length. Now, Zoo did actually make one that had a much longer focal length. And it's the focal length that really counts if you're guiding longer focal length telescopes. And I believe that Zoo did actually make a 60mm guide scope, which is very similar to this. Uh, but it had around, I think it was like 260 or 280 focal length. Don't quote me on that. But it had something as long as that. And that would have been the best option. The only drawback with that Zoo guy scope is that the ghost, the guy, the, it was plastic sort of thing. But the actual guide rings were, they were plastic nylon uh, bolts which is not ideal so I would have replaced them with metal bolts like this one but this one here I'm really impressed with this guide scope uh, really is very good quality for what it is and this is what you this is what you need you, if you're guide scoping you need a very sturdy guide scope 
So I'm going to put the gauge scope on the Mac 180 and it'll clip on the Vixen dovetail. Now the good thing about this Vixen dovetail, you can't fit it uh, on top, you have to slide it from this end, okay? So you slide through this end and then there you go, now just tighten it up. As you can see there, I've nipped it up and it's all ready. That's going nowhere. So I extend the tube as well to achieve focus. So yeah, you look at that, that's really steady. And that's what you want. So like always, when you use a guide scope, you've got to make sure you get it focused, get the camera working, target on any landscape object, right? Get the camera, the guide scope adjusted onto the main tube, very crucial. So the next items are these. Again, still got to spend a little bit of money, but what I found was these focal reducers. Now, uh, I subscribe onto a channel called Garnet Leary. He's already based on a review on this Antes Scat 6.3 focal reducer. And he, please check out his video at the top. And again, please give him a few likes as well. But here in this video, he's highlighted uh, this focal reducer. Now this focal reducer fits perfectly on the Magstov 127. And again, he has done some successful images using this set with this focal reducer. Now, very pricey focal reducer. It has a scat thread on there. So it has a female scat thread and then it has a male end scat thread as well. This is really designed for a Schmidt Cassegrain uh, for its use. Now, there are so many brands. There's a Celestron brand. There's a Mead brand. You name it. There's loads of brands that that do this particular type of focal reducer. Now, the reason why I got this, because it was really cheap, it was really reasonable price. The prices can be around about 110 to about 80 pounds. This one being around about on the 76 pound mark. Still very expensive for a focal reducer. Now this will reduce the focal length of any given telescope. Again, I'm not going to highlight too much on uh, this focal reducer, but the idea of focal reducers is to help speed up the optics. So you're shortening the focal length of a given telescope. By shortening that focal length, what that does, it will enable you to lower the F ratio. It will speed up the exposure time and it will also widen the field of view of a dim object like if you're imaging a deep sky like a galaxy or a faint nebula the focal reducer will be your best friend and this is the key component for the Maxtov. now bear in mind there are two different types of models of the Mac 127 I need to highlight the one he had has the scat thread there are some models like I have that do not fit this okay so to enable you to fit this adapter uh, to enable to fit that F6.3 reducer I have a Mac 127 now this is the older model one thing he didn't highlight is that on his you need a special adapter now the newer ones has that, that adapter now as part of the uh, Skywatcher line. Now, let, if I unscrew this, there is a thread here. There's a special adapter that's on there. Now, I've highlighted this on a lot of projects on the Mac 127, but as you can see here, this thread is what you need for it to adapt because here this is, only fits inch and a quarter 
So you need that adapter to then screw. And you can get this adapter from Telescope Service, and this will screw in there. So yeah, it screws on there. But you need that adapter. You'll need that thread adapter. Now the adapter is a Mac. It's a it's a Mac to scat thread adapter. All right, and it will fit onto the Mac One Two Seven. Okay, not a problem. The only downside that I would say is it could have come with some caps. It only came with one cap, and it was surrounded by a polythene bag. Could have had a cap on there, which is a bit stupid, really, because considering this uh, considering this reducer could, you know, could be used on other telescopes. You know, I would like to see another cap on there. All right, don't know why that is, but yeah but anyway this is going to be one of my focal reducers the next focal reducer is this now this again i got this from rubber valley optics and again i've got both of these uh, from rubber valley optics by the way so again please check out the description below really good prices and again i found this one this is the antares 0.5 focal reducer now this is a two inch format focal reducer weirdly enough it came with a case no caps though which i find it very frustrating would be nice to see a hard case ideally uh, with a, uh, like a sponge insert now this i have got the 0.5 inch and a quarter that came in a plastic case with a little uh, with a sponge uh, lining in there, which would have been better. Which would have been better. So again, this is a 0.5 reducer, and here this will reduce it half the focal length of any given telescope. Which is so with the Mac 180. In theory, if I get the spacings right, I can reduce that down to an f 7.5 instead of a 15 instead of a focal uh, length telescope as you see here they've got really good optics there it's actually very good optics on it in fact it's actually better than the f 6.3 focal reducer and that's saying something so there's really good optical glass there the thing with this one it has or m448 thread i'm sure but i'm th this one should fit ideally the two inch filters so you can actually fit two inch filters on there from the female end and then this should attach to a two inch uh, nose piece or something like that so it can fit on there the only disadvantage is it, this does not screw on at the back of a Maxitov 180 there's no scat thread on there I'm afraid but this is a universal focal reducer this does not correct the field of view i'm afraid this will only reduce the focal length or uh, with the mastov uh, it already has a corrector lens the meniscus lens corrects a lot of the coma and astigmatism you name it it corrects a lot of the weird artifacts around stars and stuff like that so really i thought to myself well a basic focal reducer should do the job okay so we're going to test this out see how it performs but so far again this is a lot cheaper this is around about 57 pounds okay 57 to about 60 pounds but it's really as good optical glass shim it, it came with a better case but it should have been foam lined or with dust caps at least but again we can't grumble right? as long as it performs well we can find dust caps and protect it that way but so these are my two choices of focal reducers all right so we'll be testing them out see how they perform so we're at the behind the rear mirror cell of the mac 180 and as you can see here that we have the telescope service two inch eyepiece holder and again it has a scat thread so I can unscrew the telescope
Here it exposes the scat thread I was talking about. Now, for the newer models, the 127, the 150s and the 180s all come with the scat thread. The other smaller models don't. And also, if you've got the older type 127s, you have to have the special adapter to fit over that telescope. So, so with this setup, you can use the Antares 0.63 and it just... So it just screws on there, like so. Really good fit, and that's what I like about that focal reducer. So as well as corrects the field of view, it also reduces it as well to 12.63. Now it won't be point F6.3, okay? I'm hoping it will reduce around about, probably from F15, down to an F9.5, it's what I've worked it out. I've used astronomy tools to work out the focal length, all right, so I use, fo I use astronomy tools to work that out, okay, to figure out what focal length this reducer will reduce down to. And this just screws, use a two inch scat thread eyepiece holder over the top of that. You can in theory use the, uh, your diagonal and your eyepiece and you can use it for visual like this. So it's good for that. Ideally, the main problem with this Antes focal reducer is that you need an air gap to the camera sensor of around about 105 millimeters for the for the focal reducing and the correction uh, to be fully corrected in the field of view, right? So that 105 millimeters is really crucial. That's basically from the end of this thread here all the way down to the sensor. Now I've highlighted it in uh, calculating your focal uh, lengths and air gaps between focal reducers and the camera sensor. So. You can get to, you need to work out the actual distance you need for that corrector to work effectively. So, with the, um, if you're using a DSLR camera for any focal reducer, remember the back focus of your camera. Now, again, every CCDs or dedicated Astro cameras or CMOS cameras, they have a certain amount of back focus to the main sensor. Now I know on the Canon 600D, they have a back focus of 44 millimeters, which is quite far uh, back into the main body. So it's literally quite far. Now the tip to highlight the back focus is this. Not a lot of people know this, but if you see, if you check out this part there, you see like a weird symbol sign there. You can just take a, you can just see it. You see that symbol? Well, that is the marking for the back focus of where that sensor actually is situated. So if you measure that across to this point here, you can find out the back focus of that camera. Uh, that focus there is around about 44 millimeters. Most DSLR cameras are around 45 in, in theory, but that's a little handy little tip to remember. Now for, for a given telescope, if you're using a camera as your main imaging setup, you'll need a T-ring to adapt to most things, all right? And this is like a 12 millimeter thick T-ring. Now, again, you could use several adapters, like a T-ring adapter, which has T2 threads. Now, this one is a scat thread, all right, and this will fit onto the, this can fit easily onto the Antares 0.63 producer. And again, it's got different amounts of spaces. You can get some that's variable, all right, you can get the exact air gap you need. Again, remember 105 millimeters is needed to work out the exact 
air gap you need for that focal reducer to work so from where the where the uh, where the reducer sits working that that gap to the main sensor will give you uh, a good chance to correct the field of view and maximize uh, the focal reduction so you can use an adapter like this this is a scat scat thread to t2 adapter you can get some with a scat to m48 i believe but again it depends on what t-ring you use so with hard crop we're trying to have a smaller sensor size because of the narrow field of view of the Maxitov, you are restricted to half crop at the most. Which, to be honest with you, you cannot use a full frame camera on the Maxitov because of the, the narrow field of view. All right, but half crop is probably the maximum you're going to get uh, for imaging from a Maxitov. Now, with this DSLR camera, I'm using a nose piece. And this is just a bar the nose piece, and this will give me an extension of around about 25 millimeters. And if I screw that on in place, okay, this will give me 25 millimeters. So what I've added is 44 millimeters of back focus from the main camera body. The T ring is around 12 millimeter thick, and again, you measured that across using the set of vernier calipers and you can measure how much you need okay so that's 12 extension uh 12 millimeter extension from the t-ring and then from that point onwards is a total length from the nose piece now what i found out trying to find information regarding the 0.5 reducer is really really hard now there is one website. If you check, if you check out uh, that website, there is a brief description, more in detail. All right, and it's the only website that actually highlights a lot of detail regarding this focal reducer. And believe me, I've researched everywhere, and the Gender Astronomy that website there is the only one that actually highlights that information with this 0.5 2 inch format reducer the operating distance for this reducer to work is 79 millimeters okay that is 79 millimeters is the minimum distance for this reducer to work now this can work at uh, varying extensions all right if you check out that website uh, the amount of reduction you can achieve uh, with this focal reducer and doing these extensions will also will give you the reduction effect as low as 0.3 times reduction which is great but we don't want to reduce too much because as you're reducing to 0.3 you're increasing the sensor size of your DSLR sensor which which will run into problems of vignetting and that's what you don't want so it screws on there like so and it, i've worked it out it's around about 81 millimeters extension which is over the minimum operating distance okay of that camera so you might actually reduce it slightly less than 0.5 but you need around about 79 millimeters in order for this reducer to work all right so that's how it works on this particular model so then guys and girls what we've done is we fitted the 0.5 reducer with the t-ring and the, just a standard dslr camera now we're focused and as you can see we we'll focus on the tower and can you spot this part here now that is vignetting basically there's a reduction somewhere in the, in the optical train so 
what's happened there is look, light is squeezed through and it's clipping the DSLR camera sensor. You can tell that the sensor is too big for the reducer that's given. Now, again, if I was to increase the extension to its maximum of the 0.3 times reduction, this halo or this vignette effect will gradually get worse. And it doesn't matter if you extend the exposure limit, you think, wow, you extend it to uh, one one hundredth of a second uh, and disappears. But when you take long exposure, what will happen if you're taking a deep sky object? This will like will create a, a, a perfect circle around the image. Now the alternatives you can do is crop. Once you take the images, is then crop uh, the final stacked image. But the thing is, if you blow it down, you can see the true reduction. So as you can see there, look at that reduction there. So yeah, it has speed up the optics, but that vignetting is pretty bad on the 0.5 times. So the way to get around that is to reduce the sensor and adopt for a smaller sensor, I'm afraid. So again, I'm working way around how to figure this out. And uh, it does work with a 0.5 reducer. So I thought highlight this, right, that you like to see how the product performs. And nobody likes to spend a lot of money. And this is what I've got. I mean, you can image with it, but it's not ideal because the sensor is way too big for the max stuff. So it does work with 0.5. I am not going to extend this even further out to get the 0.3 reduction because all that's going to do is make the effect even worse. So it does work with the Antares 0.5 reduction, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things, guys and girls, but it does work and it has reduced it. It has actually speed up the optics. So in theory, I've got an F 7.5 here, all right, which is good for deep sky objects. However, it's much too slow, but it's better than F 15 without a doubt. So the only way to get around that is use a smaller sensor. So we've now got the Antares 0.63 reducer, the two inch format eyepiece holder, which when you fit it, you get a 40 millimeter in depth of travel. Now, as you can see, we take a look and we still got the halo effect, which is really puzzling. And uh, I don't know why that is. Again, it's reduced it to a manageable roulette level as well, but it's obviously made it a bit slower because obviously it's a bit more zoomed in. So even though it's quite annoying really because I've still got that vignetting just around the edge. Even though it's giving me a reduced field of view, so this scope will work out around about f 9.5, which is relatively slow, but it's a lot better than f 15. So it'll give me a, probably around about around about seventeen hundred millimeters of focal length, which is not ideal, but because I'd be able to guide with the guide scope with, without any problems. But again, seeing from this camera, even though I've got the correct air gap, now I'll focus on the, the correct distance. Now you can use the T adapter, the SCAP T adapter, which is a variable T adapter, and you can screw that in. But using this, this component, give me the working distance of around 109 millimeters ideally i want to be within the 105 millimeter air gap from the sensor so with this 53 millimeter extension tube it's not ample enough i'm over that limit i need to be within 
0.5 to correct the field of view. So yes, you can fit it on there, but it will not correct the whole field of view around. So with this setup, for me to achieve focus, I mean, this is a makeshift design, right? I've, I've literally had to work out roughly. As you can see, I'm using the the 12 millimeter T ring, okay, with the existing thing with the camera. Again, I've used the Barda nose piece, all right, that gives me the 25 mil extension. So I've got the So as you can see here, I've got that, which gives me that working distance. So I've got the 44 millimeter, the 12 millimeter, and then I've got the 25 millimeter. Now I've had to use a variable, use a variable M48 extension tube, and this will extend to about 23 millimeters max, and that should give me my working distance of the 105 millimeter. Now ideally, and what I'm looking for, I mean I've not invested yet, but I'm looking for a bigger M48 thread extension tube, ideally a solid tube, and hopefully I can get within the 105mm gap. But the thing is, I'm at that gap, I'm at that working, I'm on that working ideal air gap there, and for some sort of reason I'm still getting the vignette in. And uh, it's really puzzling me. I, I really can't figure out why that is. Even though I've got the correct air gap of the 105 millimeters, I still can't figure out what is going on with that 0.63 times focal reducer. So in theory, it should work because I've got the eyepiece hold here and the 0.63 times reducer. I slide it in there. All right. It's not ideal because I need a solid tube, but if you look at it, if you take a closer look, and if I flip the sensor, you can just see that the sensor is just within that focal reducer. So it should, in theory, work effectively. I just don't understand why that's not working, I, I can't understand that, it's at the correct working distance, 105mm and the sensor should really fit comfortably within that reducer so it's really really puzzling me, I'm like I'm stumped now, I don't know what to do but I'm gonna find out what the hell is going on here so this is what the problem is I've took off the 063 times reducer and the camera and this is what I've got now as you see here this is a fixed unit this is what fixes the primary mirror and the the focus to draw tube together now if I get this part here I measure this gap across I use the video calipers and I measure it at let me just get it right I have a reduction of 31 millimeters so 31 millimeters is the amount of reduction through this tube all right that's the clear opening so we take a close look, we've got the antares screwed in, as you can see here, if you look at this angle, you see the clear aperture of the focal reducer, right, it's quite a large area, right, good clear opening of 42 millimeters. Now if you take a close look there, you can see the reduction from the 31 millimeter. I have just lost around, around 10 millimeters. Of reduction and this is what's causing the problem all right you can see the opening and that's how much air that's how much light that can go through that reducer so I've lost literally 10 millimeters all the way all the way around that focal reducer 
So even though the focal reducer has a clear opening of 42 millimeters of the lens system, you can see that that 31 reduction there from the focuser from the focuser tube and rear mirror cell is given. I've lost a lot of light. Plus, that's what's causing that vignetting. So we now know that the camera does DSLR camera does work with this setup, but you're going to get vignetting. Now the alternative answer is go for a smaller sensor, and I adopted for the QHY9. So this is a four thirds sensor, a lot smaller than the uh, DSLR camera. Now to work out my exact distance, I know the back focus on this camera is 28 millimeters of back focus from the the lens element here back to here again ref please refer to your manual of your dedicated astro camera what i found out is that the filter wheel gives out another 23.5 with the spacers another 23.5 gap now the eyepiece holder I thought it was around about 40 millimeters in depth I worked, found out with the 0 0.63 times reducer screwed in it actually reduced it to 38 millimeters so that means I would need an extension from this point of 15.5 because at the moment if I had to fit this okay like that so I worked it out and for this existing setup I need to extend that tube to 15.5 so again what I do is I use a variable extension okay and I need to measure that up so I just reduce it or extend it till I get the desired length which is not ideal, I need a lot more uh, reduced yeah I need a lot more reduced than that which is not ideal so I might actually get some form of coma in my images so I'm going to invest in the 15.5 millimeter extension now the threaded piece for this is a point it's a metric M48 thread and it screws directly onto the QHY nose piece so I just screw that in there in place like so so at the moment I've I'm not within the ideal 105 millimeters which I wish as you see it, it slots in nice and perfect okay nice and flush now if you're using this camera with the point five times you can just take it off like so what you do then is remove the nose piece right when this is the variable extension tube we take that off now we know now on the QHY9 the standard nose piece for it if I measure that across I've got 30 millimeters there so I've got 30 millimeters extension there from this nose piece right to the filter wheel which means that I can actually I'm slight again slightly over the uh, the 79 millimeters which is okay so again it, I worked it out and it's around about 81.5 millimeters so here I can just screw on the 0.5 reducer like so and I should be within the working distance okay and that should then If I remove the Antares 0.63 times, 
I can then in theory slot that in there like so and I will be there you go and it'll slot right in there nice and flush and I should be able to image using the 0.5 times focal reducer again I'm over the 79 millimeter uh, the, oh, I'm over the 79 millimeter air gap and I should be fine with that however there'll be a few people will be think, wondering can you use both the 6.3 times or the 0.5 times and the answer to that is no it does not work like that you cannot combine reducers with another reducer it does not work plus it won't focus and it'll just be blurred so it will not work with combination of reducers so if you're going to use one or the other you need to interchange each one to then get your system to work so hopefully I hope that helps you guys and girls there's a lot to take in there's a lot of information there but again focal reducers will only work effectively if you get the correct air gap for the given foot reducer so everyone what we got here is we're testing the 0 0.63 times portable reducer and uh, as you can see we've got the QHY9 connected up obviously we've laid it to cool down as well but there's no real need for that but what we're going to do is we're going to just do a a live capture and what we're going to do is we're going to slit because of the exposure being very slow on the 0.63 times we're just going to do like a 60 second exposure on a church tower and the reasons for this is we need to check uh, the vignette so we'll take the shot and as you see the QHY9 is is a uh, quite an old camera it is a CCD but it's very good uh, for a lot of uh, deep sky objects it's it's okay it's not that sensitive and uh, but like you see it's like 15 years technology I've got here but the camera is very capable of uh, delivering awesome images so as it's taking the exposure, it's taking a lot longer with the 0 0.63 times fourth producer. So this works out around about f9.5, I believe. I'm not quite sure, but f9.5 is a lot faster than the f15 that you get with this telescope. So as it's taking the shot, it's only a minute's exposure. And again, it has to rebuffle itself, so it's quite slow. It's not the fastest camera, but it's good. And there you go. And this is what we're looking for. So we've got the church tower, and as you can see here in this picture, there is vignetting around the sides. Okay, so the 0.63 times fourth good juice has done a good job. So, we've got the 0.5 times fourth cool reducer. It is attached to the same QHY9. And we're going to set the exposure. Now, this should be faster than the 0.63 times. However, I am testing this as the night's getting darker. So, it's, it's not going to be the same but ideally it should be speeding up the optics uh, making it uh, making the light a lot easier to capture so what we're going to do is because it's um, well we'll try we'll try the 60 seconds again I know this will be a lot faster it will cl uh, collecting the light but we just want to check uh, the field of view so again QHY9 taking the exposure and 
and uh, hopefully we should see some uh, results. So as you can see with the 0.63 times photo producer, it's not bad, but it's not brilliant. So there is some limitations on uh, that photo producer. So uh, we'll see what we get from this one. But please, guys and girls, any day it does work. Using those photo producers do work. And uh, we'll see what results we get from this one. So now we'll work for it to buffer. See what we get. Okay, because it's getting darker, I'm going to take that shot again. But looking from there, it looks like the uh, the vignetting is a lot worse on the 0.5 times so we're going to up the exposure right. so that we should see the perfect circle so we had 60 seconds so up it to 100 seconds which is almost 2 minutes Take the shot. So if I was using the 0 0.63 times photo reducer, I would probably have to um, increase the exposure even more. But with this 0 0.5 times photo reducer, it should equate to an F 7.5 on the max of 180 which is still slow in fact it's, it is pretty slow for an imaging setup but that's like halving the, um, the actual focal length of the f15 so the f f15 focal ratio yeah you know, it's pretty something to half that kind of thing and we've got a really good image there nice and quick crisp so it's resolved the image quite well so the sharpness is there it's just uh, it's a bit strange really because it's um, I can see that that vignetting is pretty bad on this one but hopefully 100 seconds should reveal uh, the whole disc so it's not bad results so far If you're wondering why the image is upside down, it's just I just didn't, I wasn't, bo I, I just didn't bother to reorientate the the camera. So um, don't worry about that. So wait to buffer, and there you go. So we've got a a disc, smaller disc. That is the vignetting there. So it's that stop from from the primary mirror. You saw that retainer ring and the aperture. So we've got a very limited aperture, 32 millimeters, and it just shows you um, how restrictive it is. So using the 0.5 times is yeah you've got a nice resolving image but the vignetting is even worse on this but it's not to say you can't use it for imaging because uh, ideally if you can get the image if you can get the DSO in the middle all you had to do was if you come to stack the image you just select the uh, the target uh, selection area the main bit you want to focus, uh, you want to stack, you just create a square along there in deep sky stacker and then it will stack that area of interest. In it will be a small image but to be honest with you, you're not going to get a, 
a wide field of view with the Maxitov, I'm afraid. Alright then guys and girls, we're ready for this. I really can't wait to test out this fantastic setup. Yes, it's a lot of hard work. I had to do a lot of thinking, um, planning, and making sure that my setup is what I want. We've got the 63 times full screw juicer. I would like to have used the 0.5. However, due to me, the nature of my other CCD not working, because uh, it's smaller chip, that will probably work with that setup. Again, I did chief focus with the 0.5. But we've got a lot of severe vignetting. But the 6.3 times seems to be more suitable. I'm not going to use the DSLR camera for that, but I'm going to use the, the legendary QHY mono camera because being a four thirds sensor, after the, a lot of after a lot of test runs and getting that right, I managed to solve the vignetting on the sensor which is a pretty big deal considering the sensor is quite large as it is not so large compared to a, um, a DSLR sensor like a half prop sensor but I've got a fantastic CCD with bigger microns so the biggest pixels which will be more suitable for longer photical lengths so at the moment I've got my set up around about 1700 millimeters focal length which is probably I wanted a lot less but I can still guide with a 60 millimeter guide scope that guide scope at the moment is literally running at 240 focal length I might be pushing it but I should be able to guide sufficiently without any problems again I would like to have had an off-axis guider and like a um, a null tag all right on there which would have been better but because the nature of that that uh, restriction that 32 millimeter restriction I am unable to connect an off-axis guider on there which is a real shame but it's not to worry I've spent a lot of time a lot of planning hopefully fingers crossed things work out now at the moment I haven't got my Pegasus Astro connected up. I'm going to buy a separate Pegasus Astro, so I have all three setups that are going to be all sort all self-contained power. So I'm just going to work with the cables for time being, which is really bugging me because now I've had the Pegasus Astro on the triplet and the Newtonian reflector with those Pegasus upgrade. I really am missing it already and all these cables that already dripped across down there is really bugging me big time but as long as I'll be able to guide and take images the main focus is getting this set up can we get this to work fingers crossed we don't know but hopefully if all plays ball wish me luck guys and girls because I'm really really excited about this I'm already collimated, which is a good thing, after I did a star test uh, last night. Sorted out that vignetting, which is really good news. Fingers crossed, and uh, hopefully, if it clears tonight, fingers crossed, and uh, wish me luck. I'm hoping we should get some good uh, images for this setup. So, fingers crossed, and let's do this. So then guys and girls, here we are, we've got the Maxitov pole aligned, we are now aligned with two stars, so the alignment's done, and we now focus on M51, and as you can see, we're using the QHY 
with the 0.65 uh, well the 0.63 times focal reducer it's the only one that sort of works really well with this setup and already we're auto guiding now one thing I need to add is with the fine with the guider being a longer focal length of 240 millimeters it makes the guiding uh, you have to really up the exposure to get a decent uh, images of the stars so four seconds are needed to get the stars to appear um, on the sensor of my guiding setup so we're all ready ready to go and uh, we are now taking images of M51 I thought I'd start off really basic and as we see if we've got the uh, we just dim down the exposure so you can see and as you can see there and as you can see there we've got the Whirlpool Galaxy with its companion at 200 at 200 seconds and uh, I had to use a bit of gain which is not ideal on a CCD but I had to offset one to one I even had to use the two times two binning to really boost the image scale it's not just that I need to increase the sensitivity of the camera so it really is tricky that focal length of 9.5 is a lot slower I'm used to working at usually f7 to usually f4 ratios on a lot of telescopes and with that slower vertical length it does really put a lot of um, uh, you really need to boost the exposure a lot more so we've got a lot of detail there and um, guiding is not so great but we've got I've, I, I wish I could push it to 300 uh, I wish I could push it to 300 seconds which is about five minutes exposure but uh, to be honest here uh, I was starting to get star trailing so I, I dipped it down to about 200 seconds and leave it there so I'm now at two times two binning to boost the sensitivity it's just I lose a little bit of resolution but at least I'm not over or under sampling uh, the stars using the two times two binning so the max itself does work for long exposure for deep sky objects it is really difficult right so you guys and girls are all seriously considering uh, doing this setup for the Mac 180 or any other Max if you can image with a max itself you are very very talented individuals believe me and to your sphere it is difficult it's not the it's not the easiest telescope to image but if you can master that it's absolutely superb so not bad at f9.5 I wish I could use the 0.5 focal reducer but it just shows you can image with a Maxitov and I do like uh, how the sensor now I've got a really big image of M51 because it's usually a very tiny very small sort of galaxy through a lot of refractors and any, or any wide field telescopes but the Maxitov has the advantage of really homing on uh, that sort of detail so at the moment I might be slightly out of focus because again I'm still waiting for my uh, Bannerstoff mask to arrive which is a real shame but um, apart from that I'm really impressed with the results so far all right it's not my best image but it just proved that one thing you can do it with this setup so very good very good setup the 180 ideally it's the best telescope for 
lunar or planets but I'm using a CCD and I'm guiding at 200 seconds which is not bad not bad at all I wish it could be better but uh, we're doing extremely well so all I'm doing now is I'm collecting 35 luminance 25 of each of the red green and blue channels and then I'll st start taking dark frames and bias frames unfortunately again I'm still waiting for more bits so I've not even got a, um, a flat panel uh, for the Microsoft which is a real shame so if I've got any um, dust particles in the images I don't think I have uh, looking at the computer screen I might be lucky to get away with not taking flaps tonight so so from that on I'm gonna keep on keep on collecting that data I might have a few beers to celebrate because it's too honest for you this was really hard work to get the calculations particular working out the focal distance and the vignetting the vignetting problem was a big problem with this setup so now I've got the optics now collimated on a star I've now got better coll collimation and I've got no vignetting so with this camera being a four-thirds sensor you'll be all right with the Antares 6.3 times focal reducer but the 0.5 not a chance so if you're going to use a 0.5 focal reducer yes it's going to speed up the optics but that means you're going to need to use a really really small chip cam camera and believe me working at a longer focal length on this setup is not easy even at f9.5 is not easy but if you can do it you can image with a mac 180 or any other max so I'm going to keep continue the good work collect as much light frames as possible and we'll show you what we've got afterwards
Well, 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 guys and girls. Absolutely fantastic night. I mean, what can I say about this cell? I mean, I never thought it was possible to image with a Maxitov, particularly the 180. It was a very challenging project to undertake. And it took, I took a lot of time to think about and plan things and working out a budget sort of like so I, so I can get everything to work and believe me it is expensive to try and convert a Maxitov to do imaging particularly for deep sky imaging I mean this telescope is just usually mainly set up for planetary and lunar work but wow I mean look at those images I mean you just cannot grumble the image sheer image quality compared to I've imaged with a lot of telescopes and to be honest with you I basically got a an Apple a 6 inch Apple refractor here for half the cost of a 6 inch Apple refractor and uh, the image quality from for there it's just absolutely amazing and um, don't get me wrong it is actually a very difficult project to undertake so please use this video as a guide uh, and again follow the other guide as well to do the super tune of the Maxitov but that fourth producer the 0.63 times is definitely a perfect match for that setup the 0.5 it's a real shame that I can't really test it out on the smaller chip camera I have because it wasn't working it is a real shame but to be honest with you the 0.63 not so much of the reduction I would like but it's not bad and to be honest with you getting 1700 millimeters focal length and round about an f 9.5 is still manageable and it's a lot easier to image on that ratio than f15 believe me so it's got a really long photo length for this Maxitov but the image quality is just wow it's um, unbelievable so in theory when you look at it that kind of image quality you'll get is something as as something like a six inch triplet refractor it's like I'm no joking but I don't have the money for anything of that sort of pedigree and don't forget when you get a six inch triplet refractor we're talking probably five maybe six to even about ten grand for a telescope of that nature the Maxitov is more of a budget sort of base telescope despite the narrow field of view and its limitations and it's only suitable for planetary and lunar work but getting deep sky objects through this setup is very very impressive so again please use this video I know it's been a long project but just go with it give it a try for your setup and again try setup similar to the um, the 150 and the 127 believe it or not Gan Garnet Leary he's done something similar on the 127 Mac uh, really impressive little setup and he's used the same 6.3 times focal reducer and that is saying something as well and he's getting some awesome images through that little setup the good advantage of that Maxitov is it's got a lot shorter focal length compared to the 180 all right so apart from that I'm really thrilled that I've now got a complete setup a big setup where I'm not just restricted just to lunar work or the planets I can also image deep sky objects bear in mind this is not a wide field setup so this setup probably more than suitable for the smaller deep sky objects like smaller galaxies you know the really tiny faint fuzzies that you'll see through the faint eyepiece of your telescope all right the really faint ones this will pop through this system and again using the QHY Q, using the QHY9 which is the four third sensor it's not massive but it's enough to get enough field of field of view without vignetting and it took a while to get that vignetting just right sorted it out it was collimation end of the day but again 
the best collimation not always through an artificial star the best collimation is always point the telescope towards a bright star put it out of focus and then adjust the collimation that way and by doing that I've actually got spot on collimation so I'm really really um, thrilled about that so that concludes my video please please hit a like button if you like what you see there all right there are not many videos based around the Mac 180 so the super tune and converting it into an astrograph please hit the like button and again if you're new to the channel again please subscribe onto my channel also please hit the bell if you're already subscribed again YouTube has been playing funny again just recheck the subscription and click on that bill again all right so so that you don't miss out on any notifications coming out very very soon and believe me please share this video out and again there may be someone who has a max stuff and would like to do a project like this all right so if you want uh, if you're really really interested please give it a go any day be warned it is an expensive uh, modification particularly the super tune and again I'm not here to just tell you you can do this and this I'm also telling you the true facts that it is expensive to modify something that's not designed for taking uh, deep sky objects but as you can see there the results were amazing as long as you get your set up to a T you it is possible to image from Maxitov and particularly the 180 and the 150 and again please check out uh, Garnet Leary's channel he's done one on the 127 Mac and again he's going to do some more projects on the 127 as well which I'm really really looking forward to because again that's another scope that I've got and I love it to bits but however the big brother is for me I'm afraid so that concludes my video uh, again thanks again thanks for watching and I wish you all clear skies